<laughs> it's going to turn somebody off right away. Yeah, they're like, pause, they were giant I faces. I can see what this one's going to be like. <laughs> All right, um, I'm Pete Travis, the Fedora documentation lead. I've been doing that for a few years. Um, forever, <laughs> they won't let me quit. Uh, it's a great team of people to work with, so, though, and I uh, really enjoy doing it. So I'm Brian Exelbeard. Um, I'm associated with the documentation project as well. Um, I also happen to work for Red Hat. And I, I've put here that I'm an engineer, nay writer, because I was actually hired by Red Hat as a technical writer um, and have moved into a software engineering role. So I'm kind of coming at this from a lot of different angles, including a long time ago, I'm old, having used Fedora in production. So uh, there's a lot of opportunity here that we want to help you with. Yeah. Uh, so we've had a lot of conversations, especially over the last year, year and a half, about enabling people to contribute to docs. And so we've talked to folks in the community and we've sort of thought about what you would want to be able to contribute and kind of taken the feedback from that and our own experiences and we put together this talk about problems that we know about and things we'd like to do about it. So we'll talk about uh, the a, a new life cycle for documentation, what would like to be the ideal experience for you, thank you. Um, and sort of what it'd be like to contribute when we get a new model up and running for everybody. And uh, we'll touch a little bit on tools that we're working on to enable that for everyone. So one of the first things we want to talk about is the new contributor experience. Um, and this is the experience whether you are someone who literally just rolled up on Fedora and you're like, hey, I was working through this and I want to help make these docs better for the person who comes after me. Or if you've been an active project contributor elsewhere and you want to, um, as the term goes, shed some light on the things that you've been working on by improving the quality of the documentation around it. And when you first approach the documentation project, and you're going, hey, I want to help. We have a fantastic to-do list that you can use. Um, and this is not a bad slide. This is actually the problem that we identified first is that when you walk up to the Fedora Docs project, there is no easy, how do I get started? There's just a blank list. Um, and so that kind of turns a few people off um, because there's no kind of engagement there from the beginning. Some people stick around though and they get on our IRC channel and they start with, okay, so what do I do really? Um, and it opens up a series of questions that they want to ask. And we want to explore these questions because some of what we're doing is working really, really well. And some of what we're doing is that to-do list that was on the previous slide. So we need to figure this out together to help make this a better experience for everybody. So people come in and say, I want to write. I want to be a Fedora Docs writer. What do I write about? Where do I start? What, what work do you have going? And it's kind of overwhelming because you can write about everything. There's 20,000 packages and there's hundreds and millions of interactions between those packages that we could document. People put in production, they use on their own machines. We could cover all of that. And if I just say, pick one. You know, it's, it, it's not a great show for you. And, and what happens is that person loses their enthusiasm because now they've got to figure it out. They've got all these things to choose from. And they don't want to pick the wrong thing. They want to pick something good. They want to pick something that's going to be engaging for them. Just kind of stop there. And some people just never make it past that. Um, and when they do come up with ideas, Honestly, they're just not always great ideas. It's something that maybe is too ambitious for them, and that's great. Uh, but you don't necessarily want to pick something that's overly ambitious when you're just getting started with writing. Or, or maybe it's just way too simple to even be worth your time. Like, you don't need to teach someone how to open Firefox. You could write a document about it, and it might be good practice, but you're going to have to open Firefox to find the documentation. Um, or a lot of people, there, there are tons of problems that Fedora users have that we just can't do. We can't tell you how to
to install an NVIDIA drive. So we can't tell you how to do codecs. All of the rules for software that is not permissible in Fedora also apply to Fedora docs. So we can, not only can we not provide you with things that are not redistributable, we can't tell you how to do it for yourself. So all of that stuff is out. Um, and there's a lot of people, you write a blog, you write an article, you take notes while you're hacking on something, you've got this content, it's kind of halfway there, and you say, this would be good for docs. Other people, they might really like this. Where do you put it? It's just, uh, we've got guides, but there's nowhere to just dump it in. So that's, that's writing topics, yeah. And so along those lines, the where do you fit problem is really a problem. I mean, it, as we've said, the established guides have well-defined scope, and it's hard to take something that has had any kind of feature creep or just total change and figure out how you fit it back in. Um, a good example that came up recently was somebody wanted to talk a little bit about the use of Docker containers. And there's not a great place to put that today. There's not a short form place. It doesn't fit in the virtualization guides. It doesn't go in the installation guide. It's not a system administration topic. Like, it's really hard for a new writer especially to even understand these are all the boxes that I have to play in. Now how do I get all of this working in? And this writer in particular said, okay, well, I'll just start a brand new guide. Well, there's some issues around that. And, and one of them is that, frankly, it's just not easy. Um, some of that's tooling, which we'll talk about. And some of that is just, if you're going to start a new guide, there's some expectations that it becomes feature complete, which could mean that you're writing for a really long time before anybody gets to see any of this, so that you've got enough material that it makes sense. You can't just start somebody in the middle of a process, for example. Um, and we're going to hit on tooling quite a bit um, because all of discussions ultimately become tooling discussions, it seems. Um, but at the end of the day, publishing is a very delayed action right now. It's something that is kind of onerous to accomplish. And so we see some people become discouraged because it takes a while before their writing is ever seen in the world. Whereas if you've got your own blog, you just toss it up there and the next day you've got comments. So that's a challenge. Um, of course, whether you are a seasoned packager or you're totally new to open source projects when you get started, you, you're probably going to need some help. It's just a different domain language. It's a different set of tools. And we're actually really, really good at this. And we've done a lot of stuff to be better at it just to make sure that we're available. Um, so we've got great team of technical writers. A lot of them are professionals. They do it all day. They're really, really good at communicating ideas. There's people like me that play along uh, and at least answer questions. Um, I've seen all kinds of questions thrown out of our mailing list and you get a variety of really good answers back from people that you just don't see unless that question piques their interest. Uh, so a good venue and the the IRC channel is it's pretty active it's, it's a laid-back sort of environment that's easy to drop into and just ask stupid questions that's what I do. Um, but it's, it's not unlikely at all to just come in there and later on or maybe right away you get an answer from me or Brian or from Jared or from anybody and they will talk you through whatever it is you're working on and we've set up uh, workshops in IRC because it is a little bit asynchronous, and if you're not used to IRC etiquette and workflow and all of that, uh, you might expect an answer within five minutes, and you might actually answer five hours later when it's the appropriate time zone for us to be sitting in front of our computer. Uh, so we so we laid out some slots. Um, I think the one I usually do is Wednesdays, Thursdays, Thursdays at 2 p.m. Eastern. That's right, and there's another one for the EMEA folks, time slot. I'm moving around so I can't play with it. It's on yeah, the it's a, The person who does it's changed time zone very briefly for the next couple of weeks. So she might but, but, but we're really good at helping, whether it's with the tools or with the writing or just because you want somebody to complain to, whatever. It, it's, a, it's a relatively active core team. 
So we're really helpful, and we have to be, because the tools are really complex. Um, frankly, there's a lot of things that are involved. There's Publican, which is actually used to take what you're writing and convert it into HTML so that it can be published. Um, there's DocBook, which is the actual XML language that you have to write all of the documentation in. Um, it's HTML++ kind of level of XML nightmare at times. Um, and it's, there's, you know, editors of choice, and we all know the editor awards that can be had. So as a consequence, we don't really give any direct guidance on that. But sometimes you have, you know, new contributors who don't have an editor of choice. They just need some help in getting over these hurdles. There's XML Lint. There's Git. There's lots of stuff. So even for experienced project contributors, there's one or two of these tools that they've never had to use. And these tools present very interesting challenges. So like Git is Git. You know, if you've contributed on the development side of the Fedora project, you know Git. If you've never done development work, you have to overcome this hurdle. DocBook, as I said, it's a fairly complex XML markup. And the nice thing about DocUp is, there's a tag for just about every situation you could ever dream of running into in documentation. The problem is, there's a tag for just about every situation that you could ever dream of running into in documentation. We have some standards, which you know we'll talk about, that say, all right, we don't use this tag, but we do use these tags. When we have this situation, we mark it up this way. That's a challenge. Publican, it's a great program. It does exactly what it's supposed to do. It's just not updated very frequently. It is highly likely that if you've just installed Fedora and it was just released, Publican will not run for you. Like the Fedora release announcement should just about say, by the way, Publican won't work for a month. Um, because it's, it's very fragile, it has so many dependencies. And so these are all challenges that we have to figure out how to get around and to help somebody over. And so we need to work on this as, as one of our issues. This, this area really is the biggest space that when I talk to other Fedora contributors that they don't want to deal with. They don't want to learn about them. Uh, and how, how do I write well? What is good technical writing? Uh, that's, that's a conversation that teams would be really good at having. I not really get there. With most new contributors, when they join the project, we talk about tooling, we talk about where they're going to go, what they're going to write about. They finally get something in there, they find a slot, they write a new guide, they start working on a patch, and we'll have a conversation that goes back and forth, and it, we talk about their markup, we validate their doc book over and over, we fix their, SM, their doc book syntax and their XML tag matching, and the conversation really quickly turns into a negative feedback. We say, well, here's what you did wrong here, here's what you did wrong here, and, and here's what you did wrong over here, and it, it's burdensome for everyone involved. It's not that we don't like helping, it's just that you don't want to be told that you did it wrong over and over and over. So for a lot of folks, once it, it gets to that point where you have something that pretty much covers all of the topics that you need to, and it kind of tells you how to do it, and it builds, I don't want to tell you that it needs improvement anymore. I want you to see the results of your work so that it's published. And this is where the conversation with new contributors should start. It should start with good writing technique. But it's a conversation we don't have enough. <laughs> so we've talked a lot about challenges that we have today. That uh, Over the years, the, the processes have become uh, more onerous, more negative feedback to use that, that language cycle. So we've kind of defined an ideal solution where we want to move to. Um, and there's a lot of opportunity for help here. Um, so in an ideal world, we want to create something that more resembles things that have been proven to work in other parts of the project. For example, we want docs to move through a defined, predictable, staged life cycle. Um, we want this to be something that is obvious, something that is very accessible, something that can be cleanly defined, and something that you can join the various pieces of. We want this to be something that we can write code around, that we can expect to have happen regardless of the document, regardless of what it's about. We recognize DocBook as a challenge. There are fantastic reasons to use DocBook. It's never going to go away completely because it's really, really good at what it does. 
but we need to allow other forms of markup to be used because a that may be all we get if somebody has written their blog and their blog happens to be a markdown based blog somewhere we need to be able to take that valuable content generalize it out accept it in and maybe over time it gets migrated through different formats but we need to be able to work with these popular formats that are useful um, we want to make sure we have more opportunities for this peer review. We really want the contribution story to start with, all right, you've got this, let's make it better. Not, you've got this, let's make it build. Um, very different conversations. And then the last thing is, we want to get the people in the project who are doing this work out of the publication business. Um, as we mentioned under tooling, the tooling has some issues. It tends to lag behind inversions. Um, at one point, there was one person in the, as I understand it, this is a little before my time, but at one point there was one person who could publish because they happened to have this really old version of Fedora hanging it's around. I'm there you go. And there's it's like one person here and one person in Europe and, and we, we that's sort of it. trade off. Because they happen to keep Fedora really old, you know, <laughs> running and it works and that's really not acceptable. And we shouldn't have to do anything. When the text is good, it should just go out. And then the tooling to make that happen kind of goes hand in hand, and, and really the manual part of the process that I'd like to see go away is translations. Our translation team is excellent. They do a really good job. We don't do such a good job with giving them our strings. We don't do such a good job with publishing them. Uh, the ideal situation right now is that we push the strings out, and whoever is the team lead for that language handles the publishing. We don't want them to have to do publishing anymore than we want our writers to do publishing. So what I really like is for the publishing thing, just like other trans, the pub publishing in the original source language should happen automatically. Zenata's got an API, Transfects had an API. We should just use that. <laughs> um, but when you start looking at the content, um, if you're straying away from the large book comprehensive documentation model, uh, then you can really start to get the community involved. And when I'm thinking about SIGs, the, the example that really comes to mind for me is a couple of releases ago, I'm working on the release notes, and I just started going down the list of all the different SIGs that people really don't even think about unless they're involved with those. And I popped into the Fedora GIS IRC channel, which is Geographic Information Systems, um, Client and Server Map Applications. And you can do some really, really cool stuff with this. So I just popped in some of this new what you guys have been working on, and ended up having a really interesting conversation for about a half an hour with a guy there. And I can remember his name, so I can give him credit. So it was super helpful, and they've been putting in a lot of work with the new software there. But it's it's stuff that people wouldn't necessarily know about unless they were already doing it, looking for that stuff, or I put it in the release notes. And I'd like to see them supported so that end users can deploy that stuff with predictable instructions. So I'd like to be able to support those things. Or the, the robot, robotic stuff, there's a whole lot that people do with 3D printers and other robots and whatever. And it doesn't have to be one big guy. It can be a whole bunch of atomic articles that we can put all these pieces together. And individual contributors in that space can just pick something up. And they don't have to be technical writers. They can be subject matter experts in that area. They can be really good at GIS and not good writers. And they can just help us and say, here are the things that you need to write about to make a good GIS server deployment. Here are the things that you need to write about to help people make, mi make microcontrollers work. And if you tell us, get it in the pipeline. And we have people that are asking, what do I do? Where do I start? So we, can, we want to be able to support that kind of stuff. Uh, and uh, on the same same page, um, false in the wiki, Fedora wiki. Could you find the page on Fedora wiki if I gave you a topic? I have to go into it. Uh, but um, if you have process documentation 
for your internal team um, or getting started documentation or just things that that Fedora group does. We can give you a place to publish it that doesn't feel like the wiki. Uh, and the last bit, I think it's just a really cool, nice to have kind of thing. If we can generate documentation on the fly, not write it, but build it from packages. So API documentation, Python module comments. There were better examples, Brian, help me out. Uh, one of them was something as simple as, would you like to know what packages are included in the various variants? What do I get when I install Workstation? What do I get when I run the Docker container? What's in the box? That's the kind of stuff you can just report out, and nobody has to maintain it. So we, we can write something that will format that and publish it, and it just happens because the release happened, and not because we went through and even ran a script about it. Uh, so if, if it sounds interesting, we've got a note at the bottom here. We're working on tooling to make all of this happen. Please come to our Hackfest and help. Mm, not happy. There we go. The new model. Um, do you want to briefly touch on this? Yeah. Okay. Um, so. For workflow, what we'd like to see your experience be as a contributor is this predictable stage document life cycle. And the idea is you can tap in here anywhere you want or as much as you want. Um, I like to use the term, term pipeline or concept of a funnel uh, so that we have this, yeah, those things. Um, so maybe you just have an idea. You say, I would really like to see some document, Docker documentation. Can you help me out? I would really like to have an Inkscape tutorial. Do you have someone that can do that? We'll just queue them up. And somebody will pick that up. They'll be looking for something to do, and they'll say, nah, I can write about Docker. And they'll start writing it. And we'll have somebody else look it over, and we'll have that peer review conversation. Um, that's where this is a continuous process because we do like, really appreciate bug reports and feedbacks from users. That's a totally valid way to participate in the docs project. And, and then it gets published. Along the way, it gets translated to publish. So you can do as much or one piece, however you want to plug into that. So the two user stories that we're trying to enable um, with all of these changes are this drive-by contribution concept. And that kind of takes on two, two meanings. The first meaning is the one we just talked about. The idea that you have an idea, maybe somebody else writes it, you help serve as a reviewer, or you just want to review documents, or you just want to write drafts, or whatever. The idea that you have a low commitment opportunity to participate, however you choose to engage with the problem or project. The other one that we're trying to enable is one where you want to own a particular piece of content through the entire life cycle, but maybe it's a small piece of content. You figured out how to do something totally awesome with Zen that needs to be documented, and therefore you own that little thing flowing through all of the boxes. You don't have to think about the larger scale of what's going on outside of that. Um, Drive-by con uh, contribution, we think, is going to be critical to the growth of the project because street credibility is measured in blog posts. And these blog posts need to ultimately get formalized and made into a document that's going to survive longer than the validity of that blog post. And yes, we want to give you credit for sharing your blog posts with your name, not just in the commit logs, but put it up on the site. Absolutely. Say, I was published here. Uh, the other model is somebody that really wants to get engaged, really wants to get in depth. We've got a guy that introduced himself two months ago, maybe, and said, I am really interested in Pi uh, Libvirt's Python APIs. And I want to write a book about Libvirt Python APIs. Great. How can we help you do it? We set him up with the repository, already new doc book and everything, and he's owning that topic 100%. And 
so he's going to go through the whole process, and we're going to have lots of peer review conversations with him, and he's going to be doing doing really comprehensive stuff, and it's well beyond something where you just pick up the individual pieces. Um, we definitely want to help that guy, uh, not at the expense of anyone else, but it's can really get into detail and cover a range of topics, or you can cover different aspects of the same topic, and you really need to cover both of those. So, um, we only have a couple of more slides, but we would like to engage in some discussion. So we, we have a summary of what we said, and basically, contributor experience is not working for us. It's not working for anybody. Um, the tooling is insufficient. It's insufficient to publish today, as we were talking about, and it's not going to allow us to create new contributor experiences. And these contributors, especially these drive-by low commitment contributors, are going to be critical to the growth and continued uh, success of the documentation set. And so we kind of have a couple of asks from you all, and one of those asks is, how many of you have contributed? I'm just curious. All of you. Okay, no. For those of you watching at home, that was a total lie. There was like two hands. Um, but the idea is, we want you to contribute. We want you to to, you know, to think about what it is that you want to do to make docs better. So that's both the drive-by model and the protege model. And by encouraging a new round of contribution, we can really road test these ideas. We, and we want you to contribute in a way that is not burdensome for you. We want you to contribute and be able to take advantage of things that you're already doing, things you're already working on. You take notes, you write blog posts, you work on something, kind of figure out, and we can just have a conversation about things you already know and derive something from that without you having to own a big part of the process. Well, I think that's one thing that, that, that you know, I've, I've certainly seen in my long time in the docs team is that there's people who start out as the drive-by contributor, and then they become the protege, and then they become the drive-by protege contributor. And, uh, and so, so there is that flexibility. You don't have to feel like, hey, I'm getting into this, and I'm going to be tied to this for the next umpteen years of you know, contributing hours and hours a week to the documentation. Absolutely. Our second big ask is to come help us build the future. Um, we really do want to build a tool chain. It's Friday at five is when we're getting started, and I'll go ahead and just flip ahead to this slide. We have specific things we want to accomplish. Um, we've been looking at some specific technology around the Git repository structures that we want to use. We need people to help test it, make sure it's going to work for what we want, that we can build the ACLs, etc. If it's missing features, the development team behind it's been very responsive. We want to get them requests. Well, while, while we're on the Git talk, is there a Frenchman in the room that can help us pronounce this word? Yeah, no, uh, no, it, it would be Pajur. Pajur. Okay, Pajur. 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 Thank you. We've been struggling We've with been, that. Yes, my oh, no, pronunciation <laughs> problem. So I was <laughs> quietly not telling you the name of the technology. Um, we also need to work with, we've been using BuildBot because that's what's preferred. We need to work with some trigger-based um, testing and building. Initially, that's going to probably literally just be get get commits to trigger a build. That's uh, happening. Using what well, we've got code, we need to take the code to the next level, or at least get it implemented and make sure it's going to work correctly, get the timeouts right, etc. We also need to work on the visual design. Uh, we need to work on creating, I'll say, the meta site that rolls over the top of all of this. So we've got all these repos and all these documents. If you can't find them, that's a problem. So there's data that needs to come out of this that needs to be rolled up into a menu system or something logical so that the whole site can be republished. And with these pieces, and a piece that's similar to this, which I did not list, um, related to translation so that we can push into Zenata automatically when documentation is accepted, this is going to get us to the point that we can support those user cases. So that's our second ask for you. And the third ask is, what did we miss? You know, what have we said that you didn't agree with? Or what have we said that you were like, wait a minute, what about this? Because we're soaking in it, so occasionally we can't see the edges. And so I think that's questions, if there are any that's questions. I um, mean, we put our email addresses up here and Jared's email address, because he's running the uh, hacker uh, hack fest thing on uh, front end.
And then our melee bars. Full of super fruity people who are answering questions. So, I have two questions. The first one is uh, where are the candidates? Because I'm sitting on the there. And the second one is uh, you said that you want to only go to wide contribution, but at the same time, uh, usually the problem is you want to have uh, guidelines that can be complicated or burdensome. How do you decide if suddenly a guideline is no longer needed, or if you do the job yourself, or if you say, yeah, this blog post is nice, but uh, we have this, uh, we are not using package, we are using this word, and this kind of stuff. Would that be seen as burdensome, and do you plan to, let's say, lift about uh, the guidelines, or do you plan to continue? You want to take number one, that? and I'll take number two? You offered him the candy. Oh. Um, <laughs> for those of you on video, I have just given the microphone. Oh, thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, so the, the second more formal question, I apologize. I, I was listening more to the second question than the first question. I was hoping you had candy in your pocket. Um, I, I'll take a shot at it. The answer that we're looking at is that you as a contributor, if you're, say, a drive-by contributor or even a project contributor, your text will undergo some form of editing. That may be an editing that you want to be involved in. It may be an editing you don't want to be involved in. But we're also hoping to find other contributors who maybe what they want to do is edit. There are actually people in the world who that is their thing. Um, and so we're going to enable both of you to be part of a process to allow that to happen. The end result is that not anyone can contribute to the publishing document uh, branch. So we will have a gatekeeping group of people at the end who can go, all right, this really isn't ready. It really needs a lot of help. One of the things we may also learn over time is that we are willing to relax some of the style guidelines that we've had. Today, we think they're all good. We think they're not too onerous. We don't think it's a problem. But if we discover that we have 100 new contributors and that they're all writing in a very clear, understandable, easy to translate way that happens to be in violation of one of our style guides, well, let's fix the style guide instead of trying to fix the people. Um, most, most of the overreaching style things are very general. Um, it's, it's not you must construct a sentence using these words or you must refer to packages in this specific way. It's don't use a whole bunch of extra transitionary phrases. You do not need to say, now that you have completed the first step, you are ready to proceed to the second step. That adds zero information, cut it out. Don't be offended if we tell you to cut it out. It, um, and it will be, use a positive active voice, and that's more of a linguistic term that I'm, Jared would probably do a much better job of describing that. Some, something was written about using passive Thank you. Um, you might want to install the package next, or instead you would say, install the package. There's an implied you there that we just put in. Uh, but otherwise, it, it shouldn't be too difficult to get past that part of it. We're, we're not going to go back and forth about your writing style. It's your writing. Write the way you speak as long as it's clear and we can understand it and you're not editorializing. It. And we're not scared, I, I hate to change the answer, but we're not scared to look at these things. You know, uh, there are occasional things that people will go, oh, you have to change this. It makes translation too hard if you don't use this quasi stilted form of the language. And then suddenly you find out two years later from a translator that they're like, would you please stop using this quasi-stilted form of the language you're making translation hard? Because it turns out translation was never made difficult by the original phrasing. So some of it's going to be feeling that. Um, the other thing that I would say is that I think this sets up an opportunity for people who, especially these drive-by people who have blogs and are posting already, this is a chance for you to get feedback on your writing not necessarily on your content. So you, this may turn into something that is actually like, I really want to participate in this because I become a better writer as a result of this process. Other questions? Can I get some to
blades. Um, there was no more. What about uh, maintenance? I do not. I, I think that uh, for the guide, someone has to be the owner of the guide, and so that person will be the gatekeeper who are keeping who are speaking off. Or I've really been trying to get people to stop using that word. Owner. Or <laughs> owner. Okay. Owner. Um, I, I would say a, a guide maintainer, a guide coordinator. You don't own it. We're a team. Um, as as far as workflow go goes, we have a couple different fast groups. There's a docs group. There's a docs writers group. There's a docs publisher group. And it'll, it'll probably end up that the branches of these Git repos that we publish will only be able to will have commit rights for the docs writers or the docs publishers group, which at the end of the day, there'll be a pull request workflow. Um, and if you do two or three of them and everything's fine, we'll probably just put you in the group. Yeah, the, the, the barrier to entry and to getting into that group is not difficult. Yeah, it's, you didn't break anything, you write reasonably well, we're going to put you in that group and maybe hope that you become the guy that's working on those pull requests on the other side. A secondary thing is that you, you mentioned maintenance specifically. You know, if something changed between Fedora 21 and 23, the guide's still talking about 21 style methodology. If we can bring new this, this new user contributor methodology online, if we can lighten this process, we can hopefully engage with the working groups within the project in a way that causes them to be more able to report changes that have documentation in back. Today, it's, it's a very heavy process. But if we can get to a point where they can go, yeah, we, we changed this, you know, it, it's more than just replacing the word young with DNF. There's like an entire thing that you need to think about, and this is no longer valid, and this is the new way. And if we can get that conversation rolling again because things are now easier to do, that's going to ultimately make maintenance better for everyone. It will also open up a lot of opportunity for brand new participants in the Fedora project to go, all right, I followed your guide. Step five doesn't exist anymore. Step six, all the arguments changed. And I figured this out, and since it's so lightweight and easy to engage with you, I am, as my first activity ever in contributing to the community, going to fix the installation guide for the next person. Um, and we'd love that. Even yeah. if you just say, it's wrong, here's what I did to fix it, if you send me an email with that, it makes my day because I know it's wrong. I know where to fix it. I know where that maintenance activity needs to happen. Because it's, it's really hard to read through all of the documentation all of the time to make sure everything's up to date. So that's sort of what we expect from the user community in general. It's just how to find the workload in this. So uh, if you look at uh, automated testing, like for Python, this job stream. There is some uh, package that just takes the documentation and with a specific format, try to run that. And if there is any error, that means that the documentation is wrong. And if we brought uh, an error, that will be ignored by the coder, but yeah. it's written so well. Um, there, I don't think there's anything that runs commands. I uh, think they're working on an amender module for there, that. There's, there's a, a testing framework work for documentation called amender. I believe only does only reads only does out now. Like this, but, um, but it can be extended. But you, there, there, there's potential to do that with well, probably most markup languages. I've been, I've been nose down in restructured text for a while, for example, and it wouldn't be too hard to write a directive that could be interpreted. You know, and you write a restructured text directive that would take that command, and maybe it would dump the output of the command into your document, or maybe it will just make sure that it returns zero. Uh, there's potential for that, and uh, the way the build system I'm envisioning sort of segments it out into a bunch of different jobs, so there's a validation step in there. And this, I don't want to dive down the markup rabbit hole, but this is also one of those cases, just so everybody knows it, where DocBook is like really awesome. Because one of the amender tests that they do have working right now is, if you mark up package names, it will tell you if the package is still available. So you don't refer to packages that no longer exist in the distribution. Mm -hmm. uh, and 
that's something that other markup languages, like say Markdown, they don't provide you anything around the content to tell you, hey, this is a package name. But DocBook can if we choose to use it that way. So that's where we get to think about, all right, for this documentation set that's in this markup that has a much smaller test suite, but over time as it grows in importance, we may migrate it from one markup to another. No more? I can uh, invent questions, but no. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions or comments? Y'all have been a pretty quiet crowd. Um, Kyle, what do you think? We, we, did we cover everything you possibly want to know about Pure Docs? Right. <laughs> so I have a question. Go ahead. I guess, one, I, I, was gonna say, I, guess I, got, I guess my comment is, is if this sounds good to you, if this sounds the least bit interesting to you, come to our, our, our hack fest on Friday. And, and help us make this a reality. So it's not just talk, but we actually get something done. Help yeah, help and, and even if you don't want to work on tools, why don't you show up and say, hey, I'd like to write an article about installing yeah, or, Apache. Or, or I need help with DocBook or anything. I need help setting up my editor. We're, we're all there to help them. Well, and the other thing is, even if you're not a programmer, come, because we can use your input to help the developers understand the kind of a solution we need. Because you know, those of us with development experience approach the world in a very particular way. And obviously everyone can do all of these command line functions. And in reality, that's not the user base of Fedora and 100%. And therefore, if you're one of those people, which they're very people, um, show up and help us by giving us your eyes. Uh, that's, that's really critical. Well, I feel kind of identify with the business explanation because I enact the door of the documentation team uh -huh. about writing something and then I was kind of this is too much and you to really get into it and then get into that book which I, I have been hearing Jared explaining but it's not that bad the the tag the yeah. HTML tag but it is a kind of well, it's okay, not. You see the, all the steps on, on top of the other. It's not just. It doesn't just take a while to learn. If you're writing things out in DocBook, and you know DocBook, and you know the subject, it still takes you a while to write it, just to write it out. And if you you just write it out without any markup, and then you go back over it, it still takes you a long time to get all of that done. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't have to be the same person. One, one person can write it, plain text, and another person yeah. can come back, come back and mark that out. So don't let that be your hang up. If you're saying, I want to write docs, but I don't want to do all this mark, don't let that be your hang up that keeps you from contributing. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah. It needed to be said. So we are basically out of time, uh, but I did want to say thank you. And I'd be interested after the presentation for those of you who chose not to speak, or even those of you who did. Um, I'd be interested to know why you came to the presentation. Um, I'll turn off the video so that you don't have to be recorded on that. So all of you people, thousands of you watching from home, you're going to you notice he says that part. as he's been totally out of frame That's for right. the last 15 minutes. Uh, <laughs> but uh, there's a reason for that. Uh, unfortunately, they did not install the uh, effect that allows me to look 10 years younger and 30 pounds lighter. But. Um, that being said, in all seriousness, I'd actually like to know why you came, because that's a driver for thinking about what it is that makes people want to engage. And I've been put on the video, so I'm going to click the magic button. So everybody watching, here's my face really, really large. Apparently the button doesn't work.